Tommy Matt, this is Liberation Now, and today I'm here with Genesis Gutierrez for an informal interview and a conversation. Uh, so why don't you introduce yourself, Genesis? Hi everyone, my name is Genesis Gutierrez and I am a Translatina activist with Familia Trans Queer Liberation Movement based in Los Angeles. So Genesis is known for interrupting the president at the uh, pride, the pride uh, dinner at the White House. Um, so after that, there was a lot of media attention, of course. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about what you were doing, um, what the issue is that you were focusing on? Um, I was invited at the White House with um, an organization, Get Equal and Familia. We both collaborated to bring an issue of um, undocumented LGBTQ people in detention centers in the U.S. So I wanted to challenge uh, President Obama and the administration on the treatment, uh, the abuse and the torture our brothers and sisters are facing. So I went into the White House with the mission to raise this issue and people so people can know what's really happening inside these detention centers. Definitely. Um, so I noticed with a lot of the media attention afterwards uh, that they treated this like a completely spontaneous event um, and that you were the first person talking about this issue. But not only have you yourself been working on this issue for a long time, but many other activists have as well. Can you talk a little bit about the activism that led up to the event in the White House? Yes, um, it was an, an overnight issue, right, that all of a sudden people are realizing it's happening. I do believe that, um, to be fair, it's, it's to give credit to the people, organization, activists who have been working on this issue for the last two or three years. Um, trying to bring awareness of the conditions our trans and queer undocumented people are facing in detention centers. We have organizations in Arizona, for example, Mariposas in Fronteras, who have been pushing this issue. Then we have the um, No One More campaign, who we as an organization got behind, and the No One More campaign is pretty much asking for an end of deportation and detentions, pretty much. But we felt as an LGBTQ organization, especially Latino, Latina, that we also needed to be part of the discussion. Like you cannot push an issue and ignoring the most uh, marginalized in, in our community. So we jumped on the wagon and we wanted to to let people know what's happening and Familia has been involved um, in direct actions, especially, especially civil disobedience um, since 2014. Uh, we had our first one outside Santa Ana Detention Center where five people were arrested. So we did the same this year of May 2015. Another five people were arrested. And then this event at the White House was June 24th. So to me, that was a moment to continue to pressure and challenge the administration. So this was a long time coming, your interruption of the president. Lots of work had been put into this issue. Um, and it seems to me like your interruption was very effective, at least with getting uh, the the issue out there mm -hmm. for people to know. There's lots of media attention, of course. Um, so can you talk a little bit about the aftermath and the effectiveness of your action? Yeah, um, I'm glad that the action was effective and I do believe that was the case. Uh, there was a lot of criticism at the beginning because how dare you come in and challenge President Obama when he has done so much for the community and uh, we needed to celebrate, right? But in my view of what's happening to our community, there was no need to celebrate. Um, I was labeled a, you know, a heckler, I was highly criticized because of the action. 
but to me this the, the the torture that our community is facing it's more important than a celebration mm -hmm. right so to me it was critical it was an opportunity that i felt it wasn't gonna come again and i just had to act on that at that moment and it's unfortunate that so many people in my own community are being so harsh of the interruption where in the first place we are able to you know go to into these places because there has been so much resistance especially through direct actions especially through civil disobedience we have that those opportunities to go into these spaces so why not continue to do them when we are facing a lot of injustices definitely there was a lot of discussion about politeness too i mean of course uh the people in the White House who are supposed to be leaders of this movement, a lot of them started booing you and everything, and people were saying the interruption wasn't polite. But, I mean, from my understanding of uh, the queer and trans liberation movement, you know, all the way back to Stonewall, is that it's been most successful when it wasn't polite. Mm -hmm. um, and the people who have engaged in actions like yours where they've interrupted power um, oftentimes the reason is because they had to. Um, I mean, have you felt like you've had other platforms or other means to go about spreading this message before? I mean, it, it seemed to me like interrupting uh, was a must mm -hmm. after a certain point. It had to be that way. Um, we have tried different ways to go and bring this issue to the administration and to do something about it. So it wasn't that we never had that option to do so, but nothing had been done. So to me, being doing a civil disobedience was the most effective and there was no other way. Um, you mentioned how we started as a movement. It was through civil disobedience, trans women of color, you know, Sylvia Rivera, Marsha P. Johnson, Miss Major, among other non-gender conforming people, they were just fed up with the treatment the police were giving our community. Mm -hmm. And to me, that was an opportunity to raise my voice and say, I can't take this anymore. So through civil disobedience, we have been able to advance and really see progress, but there's much more that needs to be made, done. Definitely. Yeah, so um, another thing that I thought was so important about what well, your message in general um, is that it centers on state violence against trans people and against undocumented people. Um, it seems that you know the conversation about violence against trans people as a whole seems to focus almost entirely on um, what individuals are doing, uh, you know, individual attacks on trans people. Um, and of course, we really need to shed light on that and that discussion needs to happen. Uh, but to me, your um, contribution to this movement was so important because it points out the fact that the state, our own government, is sanctioning this violence against trans people sometimes. I mean, as we speak, there are about 75 mm -hmm. trans women, undocumented immigrants who are being abused in these detention centers. Um, and because of, you know, activism that your organization Familia has done and other organizations, we know that our government's aware of their abuse. So that means that this is sanctioned violence against mm -hmm. the trans community and the gender nonconforming community. Um, so can you speak a little bit more about that, about, you know, the state violence against trans people, not just violence from individuals, but violence that our own government has been um, has been promoting and allowing to happen. That's a very important point that the mainstream LGBTQ community doesn't want to acknowledge. Um, our community is facing a high um, um, volume of state sanctioned violence, right? We do have detention centers, we have prisons where uh, once the moment we get Put into these facilities, we are being misgendered, we are being humiliated, we are being harassed. Uh, there's been one or two cases of undocumented trans women who have been actually, who have died inside these detention centers, right? And not making the state or the government accountable for those deaths 
to me, that's a really severe injustice to our humanity and to our community. So I do believe that um, the government plays a key role in how we are um, being uh, subject to this kind of abuse. Mm -hmm. So we need to be more aggressive and we need to challenge these institutions because we are, on, we are not only facing uh, violence inside this detention center, which are you know, state-sanctioned violence specifically, but we're also facing violence on the streets. We're being, you know, so far this year, there's been at least 20 uh, transgender women who have been brutally murdered. So to me, that's like unacceptable. And uh, the government doesn't want to do anything about it, doesn't want to acknowledge the crisis that we are living. So to me, they are contributing to this violence and saying it's okay for one trans woman to be murdered. And to me, that is unacceptable. And that's why it was so urgent for me to speak up. It's urgent for me to continue to have this conversation. And in order to make a change, I believe that we need to work for um, our liberation of the community. So trans and queer liberation. It seems like trans people are under attack from all angles. I mean, you're being attacked. Um, by individuals on the street, oftentimes that comes from, you know, uh, fragile masculinity, people being attracted to trans people and then um, discovering that they're trans and it exploding into a, you know, a, a, a fit because they're, they feel like their masculinity or, um, or their sexuality has been threatened in some way. So there's the individual violence, there's the state violence, and then also uh, capitalism has been extremely violent, um, not only against trans people, but against um, undocumented immigrants. Um, whether it's, you know, not providing health care, mm -hmm. um, all of the cost of transitions falls on the shoulders of individual trans people, um, unemployment, um, things like that. So. Uh, Talk a little more about the, the violence of the system um, as well. Um, it's so sad. You know, it is a sad reality that in 2015 we're still so much our transgender community is subject to so much violence in so many different ways by individuals, by people that we trust or that we associate, associate with, right? That, um, by the state, by the capitalism, all these are playing a key role in the treatment that we are received daily and the violence that comes with that. Um, so to me, um, dismantling this um, oppression from the top down and the bottom up, that's the only way we can start to see uh, really progress and hopefully put an end to this violence. Um, it is unacceptable to me that because we have such a uh, narrow um, definition of what gender is, right? Like the gender binary that society puts on us. So we as trans people, we challenge that. So if someone is attracted to you, um, then because we are told that you're only supposed to like one or the other and nothing in between, right? So it's always that triggers people to act on the violence acts and the, it's so difficult for the state to, to charge it as the hate crime. It's extremely difficult. Um, I remember one time living in Mexico, I had a crush on, uh, I was about 12 years old and I had a crush on this boy and I started to express myself. I didn't think there was nothing wrong with expressing my attraction for him and that I liked him. But apparently my friends, mostly boys, did see that there was a problem with that. And um, once he found out about it, he was really upset. And we were at the main fair one night and he just um, came to me, grabbed a brick and threw it on my face and hit me on the left eye. And I have a scar because of that. So, you know, I it's just this kind of mentality right it's that it's affecting our community so for me it's critical to continue to bring these issues to to the public and say this is what's happening to us and this mm -hmm. kind of violence has to stop 
So challenging the gender binary, challenging the the institutions, the government, I think it's 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 the way for us to go and just to, to make a strong statement and stand up for that. Yeah, so that's a very sad story and it's hard to hear that, you know, you've had to go through that. Um, and that, you know, I'm very interested in, in that kind of story uh, because of the writing that I've been doing uh, and the types of videos that I've been doing, trying to organize um, the community of men who date trans women. Um, and uh, of course there's huge problems right now with uh, chaser culture, uh, men who um, desire trans women but never want to be in a committed relationship, they don't want to respect them, they fetishize them. Um, so I mean your story makes me, me think of this, that trans people all their lives are told that they're undesirable. Um, it's quite possible that the boy that you described in that story was attracted to you too, um, but you know, feared what society would say with him being attracted to a feminine person um, who um, was assigned male at birth. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, what are your thoughts on, on these types of issues, you know, uh, attraction, uh, between cis people and trans people, the difficulties of dating, uh, chaser culture. I mean, what is it that you would say to to the chasers out there today and the trans people that are struggling with that kind of um, abuse in their lives? Mm -hmm. I will say once we start attack, getting down to the bottom of what's creating this and dismantle the oppression, I will tell them, my fellow transgender women, uh, people who are attracted to us, uh, there's nothing wrong with this kind of relationships, this kind of love. It's completely acceptable and it should be normal. So I understand that to get to that point, we have a lot of work to do. But just to continue to express gratitude for each other and uh, um, giving that opportunity to open your heart up and to be honest with yourself, it's a big step in the right direction. So to me, it's nothing controversial about the attraction. To me, there's nothing um, uh, abnormal with loving someone like myself. And yes, love is an important part of the human experience. And I think we all deserve to love and to be loved. Right. Okay, so I think this is a good time for our break. Uh, we usually do a short music break in the middle of each of our Liberation Now uh, videos. And since uh, Genesis is our guest today, um, I wanted her to choose the, the song for today. So can you tell us uh, what song you chose? Um, I chose North by Rebel Diaz, and I think it has a strong message. Okay, so let's take a listen. I'm the God bless America hat on the street vendor The dream the is stamped and it says return to sender Remember it's December and it's cold in the winter Your fam is far away, you tell your daughter you miss her You work 15 hours, no break or pause And employers pay wages that should break the laws The police and immigration might show up any minute But you put it on the line to feed your fam and your children The reason that you left was cause living was unbearable The cops was corrupt and conditions were terrible No food on the table and your kids are still hungry Another on the way so you rub wifey's tummy and you got an older cousin who got an older cousin that got a decent job cleaning up a person's garden they coming back with dollars buying gossips for their mamas so when you look at options there really is no coming other. up north, north, north. Yes, so real. I 
Seven corners and teenagers are so ready to kill So we sleeping in the tunnels where the rats attack ankles American dreams become nightmares Fables, faces, strangers, coldness, darkness Judges, courts, corrupt criminal charges With his kilos in them baggies Family don't condone it But there's money to be made Plus the bills ain't getting paid When he work an honest day And ain't no minimum wage When you working off the books He already in the shadows Getting treated like a crook Cops in the meat Are always on patrol Whether you're nine to five Or you're bitching that snow So since the shoe fits Carlito gotta wear it Worker, immigrant, drug dealer All terrorists in the eyes of the system They villains to imprison But who really control the arms And drug shipment Ask Carlito's father Who fought North by Rebel Diaz, and we're back here at Liberation now. Uh, so, Genesis, can you tell us a little bit more about the message that that video is trying to send? Uh -huh. To me, as an undocumented woman, as an immigrant, it's important to challenge the, the system, to challenge immigration policy. So, to me, that was a good way to capture who really is causing harm to our communities. So to me, the ending is very powerful. So we are undocumented and unafraid and we're gonna fight back. Definitely. And that song is so powerful to me too because it, it talks about um, how the system and individuals within the system have uh, really caused a lot of this um, immigration and then the right wing in this country wants to blame undocumented immigrants after causing this through NAFTA, um, also through um, the person that they mentioned in the song was Oliver North, who of course is um, blamed with, um, during the Iran-Contra scandal, um, funding rebels in Nicaragua by trafficking drugs um, into the United States and flooding poor communities of color with crack cocaine. Um, with the knowledge of Reagan. Um, so that was a very powerful message to me. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, while we're thinking about this, I, I think it's very significant that we're filming this video on the one year anniversary of the disappearance of 43 students um, mm -hmm. in Mexico. Um, so I wanted to hear more about what you're thinking on a day like today. It's been one year since they disappeared and um, what what is the significance of this event in your life? How has this affected the way you view the world, the way you view um, uh, Mexico and the United States? Um, it's very heartbreaking to see how much violence again our pueblo is facing, right? These are 43 um, students in Ayotzinapa who were, in my opinion, um, disappeared by the state. And there is a link of violence that we are facing. And I criticize the U.S. government for no making a statement on this very critical issue and disappearance that many people, it's mobilizing a lot of people in my home country, Mexico, right? And to me, this is a way that the system wants to keep us uh, oppressed, to continue to put fear in our lives, even though they are creating a lot of this um, conflict and a lot of this you know, war on drugs. It's all created by the system. 
to, to keep us in fear, to keep us divided, so the violence can continue to perpetuate our communities and divide us. So to me, it's, it's very, very uh, sad that it's a year and still we haven't really um, heard any answers that we know perhaps what really happened. And I participated in a um, panel. Well, I wasn't part of the panel, but I attended a panel where uh, teachers and even one or two students who survived this unfortunate attack against indigenous people in Mexico uh, were speaking of their experience. So to me, there was a clear indication that the state was directly involved and they just wanted to silence it like if it didn't happen. So we rather put emphasis on other issues and don't really acknowledge the massive movement of people that are throughout the world that are resisting this kind of abuse by the state and by any government around the world. So to me, it just gives me more indication how much more work we have to do. It, it gives me um, more resistance and courage to continue with the struggles and to continue with the movement. Yeah, so not only is the Mexican state involved, but I mean, one thing that you mentioned to me earlier today is um, you're very upset uh, with the White House not saying anything on the one year anniversary of this. Um, and I, I agree that it's, it's very significant that the United States has remained silent on this issue, um, almost so that they can pretend that, you know, the United States is not playing any role in the violence and the corruption in Mexico. But of course, it's it's this drug war that is that the United States is fueling, that is causing a lot of that corruption, the blurred lines between the drug cartels and the Mexican government. Um, so I mean, uh, are you upset with the United States kind of removing itself from the from responsibility for the um, for the violence that's going on in Mexico, the ongoing drug war? Yes, I am upset because again, if we look at NAFTA, which uh, this, you know, it just totally hurt a lot of communities in Mexico and created waves of migration. And then the people are suffering while the goods and services are freely flowing, right? right. So the U.S. was directly involved pushing for this to pass through. And now this major injustice happens and they're completely silenced. Mm -hmm. But if it was another connection, they would be like right on it and say, we need to change policy. We need to continue the, the war on, on, you know, the fight on the war on drugs and everything. So to me, it just sends a clear message of when they are willing to jump in to continue to expand their power, to continue to keep us oppressed. So I am fighting back and I will know back down. Exactly. And I think that's huge what you just said about, um, you know, the, the free flow of people after NAFTA creating these, um, uh, these trade deals where there's supposed to be free flow of, of uh, capital, um, but there isn't that free flow for people. Um, free trade and, and free markets have never meant that, that the world is open for people to move around. It's all about capital, about businesses to move across borders as if they're not even there. Whereas um, you yourself have experienced difficulty with, um, you know, crossing borders and, and mm -hmm. paperwork that has to be done. And, and simply because you cross this imaginary line, there's all of this paperwork that has to be done that takes years and thousands and thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. um, so can you talk a little bit more about your um, struggle to uh, become documented in this country? Uh, it's extremely difficult uh, once we made the sacrifice to put our lives at rest for that opportunity to, to be given a chance, right? To contribute to society, to be part of the solution. But what does the system do? It, it makes us part of the continue to oppress our community, continue to make it extremely difficult and expensive to gain that path to change our immigration status. Um, it's, it's sad that, that the way they do it because you just continue to divide families, to continue, it's a lot of injustices that are taking place. So I hope people can wake up and see the connections. Um, some people 
have children here and they just have to go back Mexico, you know, they have U.S. children, they have to go back because the doors are being closed on them. Excuse me, my sister petitioned me and I had to be waiting in line for over 10 years. You know, patiently waiting until my opportunity opened and then I had to apply for pay fees, pay that. It's, it's a lot of thousands of dollars that are put into to this change and unfortunately so many of our community, um, people in our community don't have the, 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 the resources to be able to change. So that's why we remained undocumented. But this is something that we can continue to explore in depth and you can take an entire episode. But I do want people to understand and realize that we are here, we're not going anywhere, and we'll continue uh, to fight back. Mm -hmm. That's amazing to me, 10 years. I mean, it seems extremely hypocritical that this, you know, this system, especially the right wing in this country, are constantly criticizing um, undocumented immigrants. Uh, but at the same time, when when people want to become documented, when they want to follow the system, they make it extremely difficult mm -hmm. to do so. Mm -hmm. You'd think that it would be easier to do if they really wanted people to follow the system, follow the laws and everything. And I think I just made a mistake. You know, I said the right wing in this country, but Obama himself mm -hmm. has deported um, more people than any U.S. president before him. So it's, it's, you know, the two capitalist ruling class parties in general, not just the, the right wing in this country that are doing this. But, you know, the thing is, they don't want to make it easier. They want to make it more difficult and they want to continue to oppress our communities. So that's why it's important for me to speak up and say no more. And we are uniting and we are fighting back. Definitely. Okay, so we're just about out of time now, but uh, since this is liberation now, I wanted to end with uh, this question. Um, what does liberation look like to you? Liberation for trans and transgender community in particular, because I am transgender, I am undocumented. So to me, liberation means the ability for our community to speak up, for the opportunity for us to organize and the opportunity for us to challenge the status quo, to challenge any system that will keep us suppressed, and that we have the capacity to lead our movement in the right direction. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for being on Liberation Now, and thank you all for watching. Um, please subscribe to Liberation Now for more videos and more interviews. Thank you. We march, speak, fight for liberation. All my people unite for liberation. Every day and night we want liberation. Come on, come on. Time is now. Take action. Rise up.